Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for the inaugural season of Talks at Columbia. The purpose of Talks at Columbia is to bring you market leading experts across disciplinary fields to engage and discuss important scholarly topics. My name is Jason Wingard and I am Dean of the School of Professional Studies at Columbia University. I would like to introduce Dr. Geraldine Downey. Dr. Downey is a professor of psychology and director of the Center for Justice at Columbia University. She is an expert in how people's identities are shaped by experiences of rejection. Most recently, Professor Downey has been using her research experience on rejection and identity to understand how formerly incarcerated individuals can overcome the obstacles they face when reintegrating into life outside of prison. Dr. Downey will discuss why college education matters for those who are least likely to get it, and how perhaps there is a need for new thinking about justice through education while reducing a reliance on incarceration. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Downey. Every year when graduation rolls around, college professors like me feel affirmed in our ability to support young people in making the transition to adulthood. Truth be told, it's a relatively easy job in institutions like Columbia. We get great students and the institution is set up to support their success. But on graduation day at Columbia, I'm also reminded of young men and women at the other type of institution where I teach. Young people like Kenya, whom I first met when she was visiting her mother in prison as a seven-year-old, and who went to prison in her 20s herself for selling drugs to make ends meet, and came home committed to turning her life around, but stymied in doing so. Each year, I ask myself whether we can find a more effective way of supporting the transition to adulthood of young people like Kenya, who face a lifetime of marginalization because of a criminal history. Today, the transition to adulthood spanning the years approximately 18 to 25, is being viewed as a distinctive period of the life course. Young people spend much of this period in college, and college completion is becoming essential to making a living wage and for navigating a world of increasing complexity and rapid change. College is the new normal, according to a recent study, reporting that 86% of high school graduates attend college within eight years of graduating from high school. Yet, a troubling number of young people, especially young people of color like Kenya, spend some or all of this period in prison or jail or otherwise caught up with the criminal justice system. And they enter adulthood without the preparation to succeed. When they finish their time and return to their communities, their criminal convictions severely limit their opportunities for employment, for housing, and for school. These limitations are put in place uh, as community safeguards, but they conspire against the strong and stable engagement in marriage, in parenthood, and in work these are roles that provide the ties and routines that scaffold successful, crime-free adulthood. Now, as somebody who studies young adult identity and who spent a career teaching in top universities like Columbia and in prisons, I'm very, very interested in the differences between what it means to have a criminal identity versus a student identity. And to be upfront, I'm also a very firm believer that promoting the student identity amongst young people uh, with a criminal identity must be a better way to go than the current approach, which emphasizes punishment and confinement. So let's consider the contrast between the student and the criminal identity. The college student identity is defined by hope. It's an aspirational identity for just about everybody. The criminal identity is defined by history, a focus on one's past failures and mistakes. It's an imagined identity that inspires fear and dread. College students are perceived in terms of their accomplishments and their potential for success. 
whereas the criminal identity is defined by limitations and deficits. As a society, we believe in college students and we're willing to support and help them in achieving their potential and in finding their passion. But we doubt people with a criminal history and we surveil them for signals of danger and we clamp down when we perceive any glimmer of these signals. When college students graduate, we remind them that their future is limitless and that they are our future. You all remember those graduation speeches. But when young people leave jail or prison, we remind them to think in terms of the constraints they face, the careers that are not open to them because of their conviction, and the sanctions they face for not obeying the rules. The gap between the lives of young people uh, in college and young people with a criminal conviction has become much more pronounced since I started working in the prisons and in colleges in the 1980s. Opportunities to be a student while in prison or in jail have declined since the mid-90s when the get tough on crime mindset deemed education in prison as a luxury rather than a necessity for a safe democratic society. The emphasis on criminal history disclosure, having to check that box, remains an obstacle to becoming a student as well as to employment, and to housing. So it's not surprising that 78% of 18 to 24-year-olds released from prison or jail are soon rearrested, and 50% return to prison. But this is a moment of possibility, as everybody across the partisan divide is reconsidering the nation's approach to criminal justice. It's been recognized that mass incarceration is simply not working. And it's well established that taking on the student identity is a pathway to success. And being a college student in prison is the best known protection against recidivism. It cuts the rate almost in half. So why don't we treat young people in prison and jail more like we treat students, as learners who can be helped towards healthy and fulfilling lifestyles, the kind of lifestyles that keep people out of harm's way? Why? is there reason to believe that this is a better approach than one that emphasizes punishment and exclusion. Research in psychology and neuroscience is showing a longer period of brain malleability as well as of openness to social and cultural influence than was ever imagined in the past. This is both a strength and a vulnerability of adolescence and of the transition to adulthood. It means that when uh, positive opportunities are in place rather than negative opportunities, there's great potential to nudge young people towards successful adulthood. And this may be especially true for young people like Kenya, who have both the motivation to change and the potential to do so. And at the same time as this research has emerged, college educators have learned to be better at nurturing the growth and the development of students with a wider diversity of backgrounds and of histories. Adults who believed that they would always be defined by a tumultuous adolescent history and by earlier failures in school show constantly that they can thrive in college with the right support. So college can be a transition to a brighter future, perhaps especially for those committed to overcoming a bleak past. So I've idealized the college identity. You don't remember it as good as uh, being as good as all this. But a student I met uh, when I was volunteering in a prison in Michigan in 1988 reminded me why it's an identity worth idealizing. I was a new PhD. I was fresh off of teaching my first college course and it had been a disaster and I was looking for other possibilities for a career. When I met Mary Glover, She'd gone to prison uh, in her early 20s. And after about five years of cleaning toilets, she decided she wanted to pursue her dream of a college uh, degree. Uh, she sued the Department of Corrections for equal access for women in prison to go to college um, because men in, in prison already had this opportunity. I, I learned just how much the student identity could mean to somebody like her. Uh, I learned about the hope that it gave her 
and this inspired me to become a professor. She was the first person to show me the power of a college education to set people free, to imagine and prepare for a better future, and to gain an understanding of their past. But it's been echoed in all of the prison classrooms that I've been in over almost 25 years. Last night, I asked my students at a local prison what it said about their identity to be in a college class while they were in prison. They told me it meant that they were courageous, committed, creative knowledge seekers, that they were determined to make something of themselves while doing their time. It meant that they were resilient and able to raise themselves above the daily horror of life in prison to make it to the classroom. They told me that they came to the classroom because we, as professors, uh, made the commitment to go there and that that showed them that we believed in them and that affirmed their belief in themselves. So how do we support people in prison or jail to see themselves and to be seen as students? How do we use contact with the criminal justice system as a turning point towards a positive future rather than a locked gateway to permanent exclusion? We're joining with many others throughout the country here at Columbia in efforts to answer these kinds of questions at the Columbia Justice and Education Initiative and at the Center for Justice. Now, I want to give you a sense of some of the work uh, that Columbia professors and students are doing with young men at Rikers Island Jail to support them in harnessing their creative potential to tell their stories through music, through art, and through Twitter feed. Our programs are rooted in what college educators know work for students. We provide our students at Rikers with the opportunity to build foundational skills in communication using the technology of new media. We provide them with the opportunity to develop and practice socio-emotional skills needed to work collaboratively in teams, the stuff of executive education. They get the opportunity to learn about and practice self-regulation, perspective taking. Uh, we give them opportunities to build their confidence, to learn about communication and entrepreneurship, to learn negotiation skills and conflict resolution. We give them the opportunity to use these skills and their imagination uh, in ways that inspire pride in themselves and in everybody around them. In these activities, we hope that they get a glimmer of what it means to have a vocation, a vocation that wants to, wants to pursue every day in every way, just as we hope for this in our Columbia students. Our programs are a small step, they're not a solution, but there's every reason to think that successful engagement in learning opportunities like this can be transformative if they are bridges to opportunities to continue on this path on the outside. Shoshana Jarvis, who works with us at the Center for Justice, saw this transformation on her first visit to Rikers for a graduation ceremony for one of our most successful programs, Beats, Rhyme and Justice. She said, when I arrived into the room, each incarcerated person was sitting at their own table. They were all facing in the same direction and they were seated across from various numbers of empty seats. The environment felt impersonal and sterile. But then their loved ones started to arrive. Parents, siblings and partners. Once the students' visitors sat around the table with the student, the jumpsuits and Spartan decor disappeared. The students were no longer inmates. They were just students young people laughing and sharing with those who mattered most to them. As each graduate was recognized with a certificate, the pride of their families and of their correction officers was palpable. Shoshana here described a moment of transformation when the young men of Rikers converted from being prisoners of their history to revealing the hope of their future. The fruits of being a student led to a truly rare moment in jail time and to use the words of the Irish poet Seamus Heaney, hope and history rhymed. 
So to answer my opening question, supporting the student identity can help foster the transition to a successful life for everybody, and perhaps especially for young people like Kenya, who hopes for the opportunity to transcend a criminal past and to celebrate a graduation from something other than the odds-defying accomplishment of graduating off parole. Thank you.